I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability, as well as its robust interior, are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. Slouching towards utopia. Uh, this is a fascinating history of the United States in the past 150 years. It basically says we had a long century that started in 1870 and ended in 2010. And it was a period of enormous economic growth that started in 1870. And I wanted to know why ended in 2010. I wanted to know why. I don't completely agree. I think the innovation happening now is incredible and is much greater than in 2010. But let's hear what the author, Brad DeLong, has to say. And it's such a smart guy. He's worked in presidential administrations, has been there, done that, slouching towards utopia. Is it true? Let's find out. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. A friend of mine recommended your book to me a few weeks ago, and I read it on a recent trip that I was taking. Excellent. And I loved it. This is like one of the best economic history books I've ever read. Thank you. So like everybody should read this if they want to understand America right now and what happened to America and the world yes. in the past two or 300 years. So what was the biggest thing you thought I got big time wrong in it? I don't think anything was big time wrong. Um, I do have some questions though. Maybe first we can lay the groundwork and then I do have some questions. But basically, I never thought, uh, you, uh, you essentially present that we were in this long century from 1870 to about 2010, approximately 2010. Right. And I never thought of the economy that way. And maybe you could describe, and, and you describe this well in, in your book, it's amazing, but can you describe for the readers, what happened in 18, what's special about 1870? Well, you know, before 1870, there was no way that humanity could possibly produce a sufficiently large economic pie for everyone to have enough. And so the major problem for most humans was figuring out how to survive and raise children in an environment in which you're so badly nourished that adult men's average five foot three or five foot four as their maximum height rather than five foot nine or so on average. Um, that that's a measure of how much nutritional stress and nutritional absence people were under. And if you were on the top of the society, if you were an elite, the principal thing you had to do was figure out how to run a force and fraud, exploitation, extraction, and domination machine on the rest of society so that you and your family could have enough. 
You know, so your children would grow up to be five foot seven, so you wouldn't be cold and wet and hungry much of the time and so forth. Starting in 1870, that changes. That all falls away. And so I, I just want to, and I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting. Sometimes <laughs> people no, say that's good. You, should let your, you should let your guests talk and not interrupt them. Not if they're have professors. Questions. You should not let professors talk. You need to interrupt them or else they go way off the rails, far down the hill, and you can't bring them back. Well, I, I don't think you were going off the rails. I just want to um, catch everyone up. Like part of the reason for what was happening was that economic growth was essentially not changing mm -hmm. every year. For mm -hmm. 200,000 years, economic growth was something like 0.5 to 0.9% per year. And maybe yeah. with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, this is all you point out in the book, it moved up to one or 1.1% 1 .1 per year. But then starting around 1870, it got a lot greater. And and again, part of the problem is not only the nutritional stress we had, but the population was growing. So the small mm -hmm. growth we had was barely enough to accommodate the growth in population. So everybody doesn't get rich if the economy grows. You can either get rich or you can have more people. And, and the world was having more people. <laughs> yeah. You know, like in the 3,000 years before 1870, the population of the world multiplied by 10, by a factor of 10. You have 500 million people rather than 50 million. And so you have lots smaller farms. And that means that even though we had a bunch more technology in 1870 that we hadn't had in minus 1,000 and whatever, um, small, better technology, but smaller farms, you know, typical human, Typical non-rich, non-elite human is not living much, if any, better. But then since 1870, we've had as much technological growth and progress since 1870 as we had in the entire span from minus 6,000 up to 1870. And we've also passed the demographic transition so that the population is no longer growing rapidly. And that technological explosion, that doubling of our technological potential every generation, that gives us lots of room to create a rich and a truly human world, if only we could figure out how. Right. And so in 1870, the combination of the Industrial Revolution and the beginning of globalization, like suddenly we're able to send telegraphs around yeah. the world. We could take trains that were pl from New York to to. California in a few days and they were safe instead of being worried about being killed along the way. Suddenly there were metaphorically the seeds for this mass explosion and growth. Yeah. The last economic institutions fall into place and then every generation, new technological power has doubled. And so the economy has been totally reshaped in order to cope and take advantage of those new technological opportunities. And so every generation after 1870, your economy is not what your father's or mother's economy was. Well, why do you think that occurred? Like, what was the magic? Well, you have, you have to have a whole lot of things go right in order to have a rapidly growing economy with lots of technological progress. And you know, the last three institutional blocks needed to get the thing rolling all fell into place around 1870. Right. The industrial research lab to rationalize and routinize the discovery and development of inventions, the modern corporation to rationalize and routinize the development and deployment of inventions, and then the modern globalized market to make it extremely profitable um, to deploy your inventions at world scale and also to copy good inventions you saw being used elsewhere. Um, and, you know, that made a real difference. You know, that someone like Nikola Tesla single-handedly moved the entire electrical sector. He, he, you know, he forward in time by 10 years, that we are 10 years more advanced in everything having to do with electricity because Nikola Tesla was there and he saw it at a time when no one else did. But without an industrial research lab to surround him and a modern corporation to deploy, to develop and deploy his inventions, you know, Tesla is simply a raving madman with some insights, but they never come to fruition and he's impossible to get along with anyway. Right. The, the section on Tesla and Edison was really fascinating, <laughs> particularly some of the, I had never known some of these, the, the quotes you attribute to Tesla. I never know, knew he was that Thank you. type of person. And it is um, critical. You, it's one thing to develop the technology. It's another thing yeah. to monetize it and get people to use it. And sadly, 
you know, he, he didn't, he wasn't successful at that part. Well, you know, George Westinghouse was successful for quite a while in figuring out how he could actually use Tesla. You know, and use Tesla's mind and brain, but surround him with people and assistants and buffers and so forth so that Tesla could actually do his work and Westinghouse could then deploy it. But unfortunately for Westinghouse, he was overextended and he lost control of his company in 1907 during the financial crisis of 1907. And the people who took over afterwards thought that the heroic startup age of electricity was over and they needed managers to kind of cut costs and manage the build out rather than wild eyed visionary inventors with ideas for beaming power through space and death rays and so forth. By the way, this is, this is um, only peripherally related to that, but it's amazing to me that someone could even conceive of electricity. The idea that power <laughs> yes. can move across yes. a metal to do things like what kind of brain could even conceive that. Now I know scientists for years have been laying for hundreds of years, perhaps I've been laying the groundwork for that. But right. if right. you or I right. went back in time a thousand years, what could we do to improve society? <laughs> like, could we create electricity? No, I can't. No, no. As you say, in the, about the year 150, hero of Alexandria, right? um, you know, he took a metal bulb, a metal ball, and he attached little jets to it. And he put some water in it and he put it over a fire and the you know, fire heats up the water and the water turns into steam and the steam comes out of the jets and the thing spins around. You know, it's an amazing, nice party toy. Right? And indeed, Hero gets to become Library of Alexandria, Librarian of Alexandria, in part because he made this interesting demonstration of the power of steam and heat. Um, but couldn't have built a steam engine. Um, for one thing, you actually need a, some kind of cylinder that will form a seal and yet move and be stable and durable. And in order to get that, you had to have had 350 years of working on cannon, right? On figuring out how to make a cylinder that is a cannon so that when the gunpowder explodes, the cannonball will be close enough to the edge that the force isn't dissipated, but not so close that it ruins the barrel with every shot. Well, well, that's another thing you point out in the book is that steel, there were there, people invented processes for making mm -hmm. steel. And I didn't even know yeah. really how steel is different from iron. But if you used iron, for instance, to make skyscrapers yeah. or cannons, it would, ex they would fall apart all the time. It was too brittle. Yeah. And even though steel is something like 98% iron, this small yeah. little experimentation over thousands of years that allowed iron to become steel, like infused with carbon or whatever. Right amount of carbon and not too much and not too little and constructing steels by putting other things into it as elements in addition to carbon to kind of stabilize the crystals and then make them resistant to shocks. You know, that um, in mythology, you know, there are steel swords. They're called magic. And they're the swords that cut through other people's swords like butter. And they're usually made by some crazed dwarf who has strong magic powers deep in the black forest someplace. The coming of material science, right? Um, the progress of science is amazing. But from my perspective, from the perspective of the book, the more amazing thing is how rapidly it increases and how rapidly the engineering deployment of science takes off after 1870. You know, once you have these meta inventions, once you have the industrial research labs to actually concentrate effort and then the corporate forms so that you know, your idea isn't just built in one factory in one town where you happen to be, but then the corporation can build factories all over the world. Well, so let me, let me ask you, like, it's, it's almost like the combination of better means of communication, i.e. the telegraph, which allows you to communicate all around the world and have more people have more access to information than ever before the that and development of transportation like never before had it been remotely safe to travel long distances and now suddenly it was safe and faster with with both boats trains and and cars and soon to be planes a, a few decades afterwards and perhaps the invention of the corporation which reduced individual risk when pursuing research which is a function of democracy allowing capitalism rather than authoritarianism. 
would you say those three things? So, so again, communication, transportation, and, and perhaps democracy slash capitalism. Yeah. Well, you know, we get, I get whomped all oh, that, you know, I want to say that the last institutions fell into place in 1870, the modern corporation, the industrial research lab, and, you know, the global market. Robert Brenner from UCLA came up and, you know, he had a session and he said, no, that's wrong. You know, all of those were simply obvious steps to take once you had moved as you moved from 1600 to 1800 in Holland and in England from a society of, you know, um, serfs, knights, and lords um, to a society of workers, merchants, mercenaries, um, and administrators. You know, that it was the change in how society was organized that opened up the space for human ingenuity to do all these things. And, you know, once you had opened up the social network, once you had removed yourself out of this rigid feudal system, everything else was going to follow and was going to follow relatively unproblematic. If I'm lucky enough for Deirdre McCluskey to review my book, she'll say that it's the change in mental orientation toward bourgeois virtue, the idea that you ought to work hard and be careful with your money and produce a lot, but not consume too much, um, that is. That, that doesn't seem, people consume more than ever. And I don't know yeah. if the bourgeois virtues changed yeah. in this period, but he, the, Robert Brenner seems correct. I'm not saying it was special, it was just those three things that history may be ushered along, as he suggests, were the key ingredients to make 1870 the beginning of, yeah. of such a, the fast economic growth that we saw in the yeah. 20th century. You have a lot of links in the chain, right? And, you know, people argue about which is the most important link and which link was easiest to construct and which links were almost inevitable that you'd get them once you had earlier links and which links were really, really unusual and surprising that they appeared. You know, and this is what we do for a living. But what I want to say is that you didn't have technological growth fast enough to get us out of the very poor world before 1870. And after 1870, boom, all of a sudden you did. Right? The John Maynard Keynes, looking back from 1919, says 1870 was the key. And after 1870, we had economic El Dorado. Um, John Stuart Mill, writing in 1873, says that all the inventions up to now have only enabled us to have a greater population still living the same life of drudgery and imprisonment. Right. And so you make, you make the point that before 1870, if people were rich, they could only demonstrate it through more houses or more serfs or, or more... Of, of something that was a commodity for yeah. thousands of years. And then after 1870, suddenly you could have, there was the commoditization of technology uh, is the way you refer to it. Is, so you could have more typewriters or more phones, more computers or, or, or better computers. Suddenly things could get better. And so, so okay, so what was the ec economic growth from 1870 to, to 2010? Technology doubles every generation. And some of that technology goes to support more people because with more people, resources become scarce, but most of it goes to making a much, much richer world, right? That back in 1870, um, something like 80% of the human race spent a lot of time thinking about how hungry they were and how it would be really nice to have more food, right? As I say, adult height for males of five foot three or so. Um, today, we only have 500 million of our 8 billion people in that situation where people spend a lot of their time thinking about how am I going to get more food? It's so funny, though, it's the same number of people as 1870. Well, then it was about 1.1 billion, right? That we have uh, been through the fact that we do have our bottom 500 million is an enormous scandal and a disgrace. You know, but like my great grandmother, you know, Eleanor Lawton Carter Lord lived into the mid-late 1960s, had a walk-up apartment on Commonwealth Avenue in Boston, a couple steps from the Boston Public Garden, ask um, my mother, when she brought me to see her, if she'd lost any teeth during her pregnancy, that mm -hmm. this was a rich woman by the standards of the late 1800s. She, this is someone who was in Radcliffe's first graduating class in 1899, 
You know, and her assumption is that people like her, even her granddaughter, would be sufficiently ill-nourished that there was a good chance that during a pregnancy, the body would decide we need to give up some of our calcium to form the baby's bones and hence leach the calcium out of a tooth and cause her to lose it. You know, that that's an index of, I wouldn't say how incredibly rich we are, but how poor the world was back in 1870 and thereafter. And now we've solved the problem of making a sufficiently large economic pie, of producing one that is large enough that everyone in the world can plausibly have enough or can soon have enough. And yet the problems of slicing the tasting the pie of distribution and utilization, um, you know, they still flummox us. We still have our bottom 500 million living a lot like our pre-industrial ancestors. We have extraordinary income and wealth inequality. Um, I live in a house valued at the multiple of millions of dollars now, thanks to San Francisco Bay Area nimbyism. But half a mile away, there's a guy living in a box. You know, drought and hunger and famine are still things and flood in Pakistan right now. Oh, you know, there are killer robots stalking the skies above Ukraine and Syria. And, you know, old people, there are old people who find themselves terrorized. Um, by those who cynically seek to glue their eyeballs to screens by frightening them so they can be sold fake diabetes cures and crypto grifts. Enormous technological powers, yet we have not used them properly in such a way as to build a society as close to utopia as we clearly have the technological power to do. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra- I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts are untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if 
one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's the easiest hundred dollars you're ever gonna make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Well, okay, and I agree. Like, clearly we're not in a utopia, and there's there's always questions where is it over? And I remember in the, in the financial crisis, this was a common topic. Did capitalism fail? Was capitalism ending? And, and even now we're having that, that same discussion. And in 2000, 2001, we had the discussion. In 1997, we had that discussion. Uh, you were, you were in, the, in the Clinton administration at that point. Yeah. So I'm just curious. Like, there's one concept where you look at the 20th century, and at first, from 1870 to, I guess, 1960, we, we made things faster. So we went from mm-hmm. trains and boats to cars and then planes and then rocket ships and we got faster. And then from 1960 on, we, we, it was all digital. We, we had the invention of the yes. computer, then the internet, then the web. And now everybody in the world doesn't need to go fast. We're, we're at the speed of light just sitting at home. And so mm-hmm. it seems like those, those are the two halves of what happened in the, in the long 20th century. And then what well before we get to what happened in, in 2010 i want to i do want to ask you about what you said about milton friedman and monetary policy and then and then reagan so so milton friedman held that uh depressions and recessions and inflation all of these things are purely a function of the money supply of the money supply yes right and but then you used as a counterexample saying it doesn't work that Ronald Reagan, who promised to reduce government, actually caused a worse situation with inflation and, and the economy and so on. But, but like my question was, that was Ronald Reagan's intent, but he, and you point out, he actually increased government and, mm-hmm. and, uh, quite significantly. So was, was Reagan, I, so maybe I just didn't understand the way you're describing that example. Was Reagan really an example of Milton Friedman's policy or was he the opposite? It seems like he was the opposite of what Milton Friedman was trying to say. Well, they were trying to implement, you know, um, you know, in the 1970s, there was this criticism of the way things were being run. Things were over bureaucratized, that there was too much centralization, that there were too many pointless rules, that taxes were too high, um, that too many people were feather betting, either mooching off of social programs or mooching off of the fact that they had been lucky enough to find a job that had a strong union. And that what we really needed to do was to um, expose more of the world and the economy to market discipline, to make the neoliberal turn, um, to make people be financially punished by not behaving, which meant that you needed to make the rich richer by lowering their taxes so they would develop or spend, have more incentive to spend their time becoming job creators. And you needed to make the non-rich poorer by cutting back on social welfare programs um, because they needed to have an incentive to work harder as well. So you're saying this is what Reagan wanted to do. Yeah, and it's a broad thing, you know. It's, you know, Jimmy Carter, who leads the offensive against airline and trucking regulation and thus against the pilots and also the air traffic controllers and the um, Teamsters unions, although the air traffic controllers do not strike until Reagan's administration. I mean, they thought they had it wired because they'd supported Reagan for the presidency. And so they struck thinking he was on their side and lo and behold, he wasn't. 
Um, and this general view that society needs, needs more discipline and we need to have a revived form of classical liberalism, you know, the neoliberal term. You know, one of my models and also one of my irritants in writing this book is a British Marxist historian, you know, Eric Hobsbawm, who was a communist to the end of his days. And, you know, if you got him drunk, you could get him to say that Stalin's collectivization of agriculture in the 1930s with its 5 million dead um, was worth trying because it might have been road, the road to utopia, even though it was a horrible botch. But still, something like that would have been worth trying. But even Hobsbawm wrote that, um, you know, that the good ship mixed economy needed a thorough neoliberal cleansing scrub by Margaret Thatcher. Um, that the view that things were out of control and needed more discipline. You know, and Ronald Reagan thought that he would do these things and he would cut back the size of the government and we would get a return to normal, to what had been thought of normal rates of very rapid productivity growth. We would get the restoration of a moral center of society as people once again understood that the old bourgeois and Puritan virtues were good things. Um, and we would get a very sharp reduction in the number of moochers using their position to extract rents of one form or another from society and get a fairer distribution of income and wealth as well. And yet none of those really came true. Instead, things burbled along with subpar productivity growth, with increased rent seeking. The only promise that Reagan and company were actually able to deliver on was to increase income and wealth inequality. Right. So, so in this experiment, yeah. was it the case that trickle down theory, I never get, I never know the answer to this because there's both, there's two sides. There's two sides to everything, but the basic one, Reagan reduced taxes from whatever it was, 70% to 28%. Mm -hmm. And the premise was if people had more money, as opposed to the government having more money, jobs would get created. And those people who were looking to the government for money would instead be able to find employment and more satisfaction in their lives by, by working towards a bigger effort and, and so on. So that, that's the trickle down theory roughly. Did that not happen or did it partly happen or did it happen? With the neoliberal turn in the global North, right? Comparing 1945 to 1980 with 1980 to the present in the rich countries of the North Atlantic, you know, it simply did not work. And yet, if you take a step back, um, and you say, let's compare what happened in the capitalist world up until 1990 with what happened in the communist world and the really existing socialist world. Because when the Berlin Wall came down in 1990 and we could actually get a good look at the economy of the Soviet Union and its satellites, you know, we saw they were only about one fifth as rich as Western Europe and the United States, you know, that having not social democracy, but full-fledged central planning socialism kind of robbed you of 80% of your potential productivity. And certainly Deng Xiaoping's accession to power in China in 1976 and saying, we're going to throw away all of this Maoist stuff. We're going to trust the market. Has been an enormous, enormous boom. Rajiv Gandhi in 1986, taking power and saying, we're going to dismantle this system of regulation that my grandfather built up after 1947. You know, enormous boom in India. Right In the very big picture, we're trusting the market has been enormously productive and enormously beneficial and enormously wealth creating. Um, the relatively minor shifts that you know, the Reagan and Thatcher administrations attempted, their successors attempted to undertake. Um, not so much. Yeah. That is that they were in the context of an economy that was already getting the big things right. And in the process of trying to get the big things righter, they got some smaller things wrong. What failed? Because right now more people are employed than ever as a percentage oh, yeah. of the population. Yeah. And oh, yeah. technology, of course, has been growing even faster. Yeah. And I get it with income inequality, but if you forget the top 1% and, and mm -hmm. view that as a flaw of, of society, are the bottom 99%, yeah. do they have income more equally distributed? No, right. That are, that, what was it? It was the Financial Times had a good story last week that actually had a bad headline. 
about how you, the United States is a relatively is a rich country with some very with a considerable number of very very poor people. You know, our institutions to spread prosperity across the country are not working too well, and indeed haven't been working too well since 1980. And of course, if you want it, you can say, and you would be right to say that before 1980 they weren't working well either. Yeah, uh, that the relative equality of family incomes or the small distribution of family incomes before 1980 um, doesn't reflect the fact that women have very few options other to be under the thumbs of their husbands, their brothers, um, and that you know the racial picture is absolutely totally abysmal, you know, before 1980 in a way that it is not so abysmal today. Um, yeah, you know, we've done. Extremely well, amazingly, astonishingly, uniquely, unprecedentedly well at making a sufficiently large economic pie. Uh, but as the problem of slicing, of equitably distributing it, we're really not doing that well at all. And then there's the problem you know, of tasting the pie, of utilizing it, of using our technological powers to live lives wisely and well. And it is certainly the case that the people, say, of West Virginia, um, are now an awful lot richer than their grandparents and great-grandparents in the day when 20% of the West Virginia workforce went down into the mines to dig out the coal. Um, but they seem, people of West Virginia seem significantly less happy than their grandparents and great-grandparents did. And sufficiently more gullible um, to politicians who I think everyone ought to be able to recognize as, you know, a incompetent grifter with a kind of talk a, a savvy line out for him or herself. What I'm curious about, though, is, I mean, it, there's a lot of ways to measure progress, and it's yeah. easy to move the target, whether it's happiness or financial security yeah. or, mm -hmm. um, uh, you mm -hmm. know, right now, everybody seems to have a smartphone. Homeless people in the street have a, a smartphone, for instance. And also a lot of homeless people are have mental health issues. Yeah, and in some sense, this is really, really important, right? That um, my great-grandfather, Roland, was a professor at Washington University of St. Louis and was quite jealous of his brother, my great-great-uncle Abbott, because Abbott was a professor at Harvard, and mm -hmm. Harvard had a library of five million books, while Washington University of St. Louis had a library of only 500,000. So if there was a rare book that Roland wanted, he couldn't get it except by going to Cambridge, Massachusetts, visiting his brother and have his brother sneak it out of the library. And, you know, this was something that was substantially and very unhappy. And yet now, you know, as you say, the homeless person on the street has access, more access to information, and the lack of which made my great-grandfather Roland, a rich guy in St. Louis, extremely sad. That we have enormous, enormous technological powers, yet somehow we haven't used them to build a society in which people feel sufficiently respected, sufficiently equal, people think they have a sufficient voice. I, I agree with that. Although, like you said, yeah. women feel more respected than they did 60 years ago. Uh, they are more the, respe they're more respected, but also they are expectations of what they should do have risen in some sense. Right. But, but also compared to third world countries oh, yeah. that oh, used yes. communism, we fared better. Oh, yes. So what went wrong, essentially? Technology doubles every generation, and that creates immense, enormous wealth. But the fact that the technology now is not the technology of 30 years ago means that all kinds of you know, industries, occupations, livelihoods, and communities are destroyed. You know, Joseph Schumpeter called the process of economic creative destruction. And if you're on the downside of that process of creative destruction, you know, the fact that you no longer recognize your community, you know, that all the shops in downtown have closed, you know, and that even if you can buy lots of very cheap stuff at Walmart or the shopping mall out in the suburbs, you may well think that you wished for a, you wish for a world in which you had a job in which you thought you were respected. 
and in which you had a community in which you were comfortable. To the extent that you move to a sense to give more power to the market economy, you know, well, the only rights that the market economy recognizes are property rights. And so the only people who have a voice you know, over pretty much anything are the people who own the property. And yet people think they ought to have a voice and a say and ability to control and be heard, even if they don't have property. People think they have a right to a stable community um, that they recognize. People think that they have a right to an occupation that shouldn't disappear because someone thousands of miles away thinks it doesn't pass a maximum profitability test. Um, people think they have the right to the standard of living that they deserve because of who they are and how hard they've worked. And also people get very, very jealous very quickly of other people who they think are mooching are somehow getting more in the sense of income and wealth than they deserve. But what's an alternative? Because you, you mentioned the, the, the Marxist economies didn't work so well. No, didn't work, didn't work. And it does seem like even in the US, and by the way, I'm not saying this from a political point of view. I'm not a, I'm not a, a libertarian or whatever. I'm just curious, like it, seem, it seems to me as a citizen that government involvement does more harm than good when they focus on an industry. And a great example might be the student loan industry where tuitions have gone up faster than inflation every single year, essentially, since Johnson implemented student loans. So, or since the GI Bill even, where, where you know, which is well-deserved that veterans should have free education, but it skewed the incentives of college presidents and, 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 and 18 year olds in terms of, you know, raising tuitions and taking on debt. And now we have this student loan debt crisis. Yeah, you know, that around, this is part of the neoliberal turn, right? That in the 1970s, running state colleges was expensive. And, you know, the idea was that people who went to state colleges, you know, they were people who'd been well-educated and they're probably smart and they have relatively bright prospects. And so, you know, Ronald Reagan and then is also his successor, Governor Jerry Brown, asked the question of why am I collecting taxes from the, you know, assembly line workers of Los Angeles and using it to give a zero tuition ride to students at the University of California at Berkeley who are going to grow up to be very rich. And by the way, they also came from well-to-do families. And so the idea is that you move state colleges from being funded by the government to being funded by the individuals that are going to college, but lots of them are young and lots of them don't have rich parents. So then you say, okay, we're going to establish the student loan system and we're going to cut back on you know, how much state money goes to fund education. And lo and behold, a decade and a half later, we have state College is quite expensive and student loan burdens are quite burdensome, especially because lenders are very, very good at figuring out how to make it sufficiently complicated that you miss a payment at some point. And then once you miss a payment, the penalties and the fees are added on and then they snowball. Plus, 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 you educate a lot of people for degrees. Um, and then you throw them into a labor market after 2008, which is absolutely, absolutely awful. You know, plus, 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 as state college tuitions go up, um, there's a market opportunity for lots of private colleges to come in and say, we are actually going to train you to do something useful. But because they're not so much educational as profit-making institutions, they're much better at selling people on an education than giving them. Um, and if it, say, is Stanley Kaplan University, well, you know, Stanley Kaplan University is part of the same conglomerate that is the Washington Post. So somehow desires from the Department of Education that we need to regulate these for-profit colleges because they are institutions that regard education as their mission, they regard profit as their mission. And, you know, yes, colleges are bureaucratic, but at least they're good intention. Um, well, lo and behold, somehow politicians who are scared of the Washington Post are never willing to sign the forms to actually get the regulation of for-profit colleges launched. And so, lo and behold, now here we are in this situation in which we have a generation and a half that's graduated 
a great many of whom have student loan debt, which is relatively onerous and which has not come with any benefits in terms of increased career opportunities um, or availability. You know, that education on average is still a very good investment for a young person to make, but, you know, that average individuals are never the average. I mean, an awful lot of people have gotten messed up by the system. Um, you know, and this is part of the failure of the neoliberal term, the fact that we need to get things more market-oriented and more things on their own bottom and more respect for market forces. You know, and yet it has gone wrong. Um, but, you know, what's the solution? Um, well, the solution is big and complex. You know, um, a not terribly effective Band-Aid for the solution was Joe Biden's, all right, let's declare a, you know, let's declare um, an end to your first $10,000 of student loan debt. You know, and, you know, it costs the government $35 billion a year to do this. Um, and if I was going to spend $35 billion a year, that's not how I did it. But Biden made it as a campaign promise, and keeping campaign promises is a good thing. And while it's not how I'd spend $35 billion you can, a year, you can't persuade me that it makes the world worse off. And by the way, I'm, I'm just using that as an example of... Yeah, yeah. I have no it's opinion a good on example. Biden's... I mean, I'm yeah. happy for the people who get their loans forgiven. They yeah, yeah, deserve but Ted it. Cruz isn't right. Um, we all know what Ted Cruz's reaction to this was. It was that the slacker barista who majored in lesbian dance therapy at Sarah Lawrence has absolutely no business getting a ten thousand dollar present. Right, and so what? What I say is not important, but don't hate the player, hate the game. It was the game. The, the government yeah. creation of student loans and the fetishization then of higher education yeah. as opposed to vocational education. I would say the game of the government moving away from the social democracy idea that everyone should be able to go to college tuition free to the neoliberal market oriented idea that the government should set up a student loan system so that the people who went to college paid for it on the back end. Right. Although, although maybe if the government had done nothing at all, we would have seen market forces actually, and, and again, I'm not being down Which on government. How, 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 how? Because maybe, maybe instead of all of the majors with the word studies in it, there would have been more people seeking out vocational um, educations, like to be an electrician or to be, uh, you know, one of these well-paying jobs that don't require a four-year education. Yeah, but see, so don't know what happens when we don't have the government involved in education funding then education becomes available only to the children of the rich, simply because you can't really get anyone or organization willing to commit up front to fund the education of those who don't have parents who can pay for it on a sufficiently large scale. You know, we know what that looks like. It looks like the late 19th century US or the late 19th century Britain or high school and college are things that happen to the rich. But but now education is at our there's commoditization of education. Yeah. But the branding of education hasn't caught up. So I have all the information I need at my fingertips, and even instructors and course programs to keep the discipline of learning. Yeah. But we have branded because there's this multi-trillion dollar student loan industry created by the government, we've branded college as something that is necessary for a job when in fact it really isn't in many cases. Uh, necessary to do a job. Why can't you just become a Microsoft certified system engineer? Yeah. Why do you have to have a degree in computer science from UC Berkeley? Why, why have we been unable to get the vocational post high school system up and running effectively? You know, when the Germans have. All kinds of very complicated um, and very naughty issues and decisions to be made that aren't very well reflected in saying everything has to be done either by the market or by the government. Right. And there are lots of sectors in which, you know, I mean, I mean the market does very well um, if it's selling you something that you understand and that you understand whether you like it or not, often because you're a repeat purchaser. But, you know, if you look at, 
education, at an awful lot of health care, at you know, other things like prisons, um, places where the where the where the person who is being you know, receiving the service or the person who the service is being acted on is not a terribly good judge of whether they're getting their money's worth, right? Then if you make, if you give people the hard incentive of saying you'll collect a lot of money if you charge a lot up front and then don't pay much for what you're providing, um, the incentive to grift just becomes extremely large. Yeah. So and I think this is again the problem of utilization. You know, that we were very good at becoming immensely wealthy, but Figuring out how to actually utilize our wealth so that we give a good education, you know, to everyone is turning out to be a problem that we cannot solve. This is such a valuable service for all business owners. Big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what where your costs are, where your revenues are, where where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash james. That's netsuite.com slash james to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash james. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take 
one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov. You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. So what happened in 2010? I mean, you, you have kind of the long century from 1870 to 2010. We talked about 1870 and in between. What, what, what happened in 2010 to... Well, from 1870 to 2010, our technology is doubling every generation. And we can see that we are figuring out how to create a world in which we can bake a sufficiently large economic pie. We just need to slice and taste it. We just need to distribute it and utilize it. And, you know, from 1870 to 2010, we continue to fail to properly slice, to properly distribute and utilize it. But we pick ourselves up again and try again. Um, but after 2010, the rate of economic growth slows way, way down. We're no longer baking a much larger pie with each passing generation. Um, after 2010, it becomes very clear that we really do not know how to manage um, these economies that we're in control of to avoid major financial crises, and we come to the edge of another Great Depression. You know, after 2010, other problems arise. Nuclear proliferation reaches critical mass, to make a very bad pun. Um, the world continues to fail to deal with global warming, with the result this year that the monsoon is 200 miles south of where it ought to be and Pakistan is flooded and the Yangtze River is six meters below, you know, where it's supposed to be. You know, plus the idea that, you know, first Britain and the United States had kind of the institutions right. And you should look at them carefully because they had done more with this technology than you had. And you should think at least about whether you should adopt their institutions that has all fallen away, that there is nobody in China and India right now who thinks they have anything to learn from the United States, you know, that you go and talk to someone from there and they say that, you know, Nahendra Modi may be a nasty character in some ways, you know, and Xi Jinping may be overly aggressive in how much authority he wants. But do you really think a system that can produce a President Trump has anything to teach us about how to run our country. Um, and, you know, that's a pretty hard argument. Um, that's a pretty hard argument to answer. And all of these things becoming the loss of the idea that we actually know something about what the right system is going to be, um, the coming of global warming to salience as a problem that we're not dealing with, you know, nuclear proliferation, the big slowdown in growth and our continued incompetence at managing the economies, um, all these mean that the story from 2010 on is going to be fundamentally different than the story up to 2010. But I don't yet know what the story after 2010 is going to be. I mean, it's very interesting because compare the decade after 2010 to the decade yeah. when you were, were in government in the 1990s. So the 1990s had, let's say, reduced money supply spending, like the, the Federal Reserve at that point wasn't creating trillions of dollars and just dumping it on the economy. And at yeah. the same time, you yeah. had such a great rise in tech, computer technology, particularly, and, and, and yeah. the internet and the web, that that yeah. was much faster than the growth needed to s sustain the population. So we were able to do other things with it. And that was a great time. 2010, suddenly you have this massive money printing that starts to take effect. The money printing was in 2009, but it starts to take effect in 2010, which 
I don't know how that affects things actually, but was that a contributor compared to 1990 towards the slowdown we felt? Well, it actually doesn't seem to have. You know, the Federal Reserve in 2010 was looking at the economy and saying we have 10% unemployment. This is really not good. Right. And that, you know, the Congress and the president are fighting over whether the government should actually, you know, buy more things to try to put more people to work and deciding not to. Um, that is, they're worrying about the deficit and Obama is threatening to, to um, you know, veto spending bills. So maybe if we try to do our job to make it easier for people to spend, um, we'll be able to get unemployment down. So what they did was they said, OK, we are going to buy a huge amount of government bonds and also some mortgage bonds for cash. And then because people will have more cash in their pockets and because they won't be holding the risk associated with these mortgage bonds, um, the default risk associated with these mortgage bonds and the duration risk associated with these treasury bonds, maybe people will spend more and we can get the unemployment rate down from 10% fairly quickly. Didn't work. People were happy to sell their bonds to the Federal Reserve in return for cash. Um, because they were worried that something might happen to the value of the bonds, but then they just took the cash and they squirreled it away and they didn't spend it. And so, you know, the Federal Reserve now has this very large portfolio of bonds it has bought and of cash that it has issued. And yet that shift didn't do much of anything to the economy at all. You know, quantitative easing was pretty much a zero. And now they're thinking about how they should unwind these transactions. You know? that is, sell off their bonds and get in return for all the cash they emitted, um, and how to do that without causing any disruption in financial market. Now, why, why didn't people spend more? We're U.S. citizens. We have a known savings rate of zero. This is a very interesting question, and this is why um, my old teacher, Larry Summers, really does deserve the Nobel Prize in economic science for his focusing on this secular stagnation as a key issue in the economy and focusing on it very early in 2010 and 2012 when no one else was worried about it. Yeah, um, that, you know, when people don't spend, right? When, when people, you get a depressed economy when people don't want to spend. Um, and when people want to save more than their incomes are, you know, well, because your spending is someone else's income, if everyone wants to save more than their income, then total incomes spiral down until you reach the point where people say, oh, no, I know I would know I want to spend less than my income, but my income has fallen so much and I'm now so poor that I'm going to forget about that for a year or two and just spend my income. You know, and when the economy gets there, it settles into an under underemployment near equilibrium with the unemployment rate at 10%, 8%, 6%, whatever. You know, and that's where we were from 2010 to 2015. And it used to be that people thought there were two reasons. One is that if people are really short of cash, of, and they say, I need to have cash in my wallet, in my bank account, under my mattress in case something bad happens and I need to spend a bunch of money quickly. You know, if people are really short of cash, then you can have a depression. You know, and Milton Friedman said the solution to that is you print more cash and you throw that cash out into the economy until people are happy with the cash they hold and then they spend equal to their incomes again. If there's a shortage of people's belief that there are good opportunities to save and invest, if people say, well, gee, I want to save, but I don't actually want to use those savings to actually build a building or buy a machine tool and put it to work in a factory, if there's a shortage of savings vehicles, then you get a depression. And John Maynard Keynes said the answer to that is to have the government step in to have a somewhat comprehensive socialization of investment, that if no one else is willing to run the risks of buying machines and building buildings in the hope that they'll be profitable in the future, the government has to step in. But now, since 2010, we've had um, 
that people want not so much cash that they can spend or not so much investment opportunities that will be profitable that they can see, but rather people simply want safety. People want assets they can hold, that they can be confident will not lose their value. In a complicated and uncertain world, there are very few such things, and they are largely the debts of trusted governments. And so since 2010, we've been perennially in a situation in which you know, whenever the economy expands, it tends to be cut up short because people say, I would like to have more 10-year treasury bonds in my portfolio. You know, I want to have more safe assets. I don't like the risks of the stock market or even of private bonds, let alone other things. I want more treasuries. You know, and so the price of the US treasury has been sky high, but there haven't been enough of them. The world economy has been short of safe assets. And so as a result, we've always been bumping around and uh, toward the edge of depression with the Federal Reserve repeatedly lowering interest rates to zero to attempt to get the economy moving again and finding it isn't working well. Right, and also you can say the demand for the dollar from around the, from other governments has been huge. Yes, yes. A lot of this demand for U.S. Treasury bonds say, comes from people in China who think that, you know, um, should they suddenly have to flee China in their Learjet um, or in a rubber boat, it would be very nice to get to Los Angeles and have a large account of treasury bonds um, that they can access there rather than winding up in Los Angeles as a penniless refuge. You know, that's a lot. I'm wondering, though, also, what, like, always before 2010, people wanted something new. Maybe they wanted a faster computer or, or, or music on mm -hmm. their cell phone or whatever, or an electric right. car. Now, and maybe this is 50 years from now, this is going to sound like something an old timer would say, but maybe everybody has everything they need. Like if you, if you had an extra, if you had extra money, let's say your income doubled, what would you, how would you change your lifestyle? What else do you need? Um, well, I would want to buy a beach house, right? Um, so, but yeah, you take it, that it's largely a relative income thing most of the time, you know. But yes, the fact that people are not willing to... You can't buy two phones, for instance. The people that people's desire to not spend their money now, but save it for the future. Yeah, that in a well-functioning economy, the, the interest rate and the terms of loans and investments are such that you match people's desire not to spend their money now on consumption goods, but save it to the future, um, with the desire of other people to, um, you know, build factories and buy machine tools and set up expanding businesses. Um, and those match, and so you can put everyone to work and have an economy at full employment. Yeah, but the secular stagnation point is that since 2010, um, there hasn't been that huge a demand to build extra factories and install extra machine tools. You know, some, yes. You know, what is it? Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation is going to spend $35 billion in, in expanding its capital this year to make um, chips and you know, Intel is worried it's falling behind because it's only going to spend 20 billion. But for the economy as a whole, money is made not so much by investing in capital as by finding a market position and launching a good idea. Um, that it's a different, that one makes money not by building out one's production process, but by finding a key place where people have to move by. And that indeed is a profound and fundamental shift and that took place around 2010. And that is the cause of a lot of our economic malaise and for his analysis of it, Larry Summers deserves the Nobel Prize, even though I do not think we yet have the issue quite yet nailed. It. I'm still wondering though, like what else, like it could just be the case that people don't want as many things. <laughs> Like we all have, well, we, we all have the characteristics of an emperor. We all have everything, you know, maybe I would like planes to go a little faster. People who are in the upper middle class and people who are rich are having a hard time figuring out how they would like to save an awful lot of their income. 
uh, how, how they would like to spend an awful lot of their income. But if we had a more income, dis more equal income distribution in the United States and much more so in the world, there still would be an awful lot of things that people would want to have that they don't. Right. That what it is, it's the people who want don't have the money. And the people who have the money don't have the want. And the people who would like, who in normal times would like to borrow and take the savings and use them to build factories and buy machine tools are instead focused on creating a unicorn, creating an internet business model, which doesn't require a lot of upfront spending. Right. That it's that fact that has gotten us which that the people who have the wants don't have the money, um, that the people who have the money can't really see how, don't have the time to actually consume it and so want to save it. And the people who would normally be investing it and expanding our capital stock are instead spending their time trying to build capital light businesses. That's how we've gotten witched. What's happening now? I mean, right now we're in this weird state in the economy where, you know, the economy closed down for mm -hmm. anywhere between mm -hmm. six and 18 months, depending on where you were. We had $9 trillion in either fiscal policy or, or, or Federal Reserve stimulus. He did, yes. And maybe some faith in the dollar got lost. So, uh, and, and, and not only is Although the dollar is stronger now than it's been in a long time, that the market appears to have a lot of faith in it. So is, is the inflation more monetary based or supply chain based? And then how do you solve these things? Well, you know, right now we're trying to reopen the economy and we're trying to reopen the economy in a new configuration. It looks like when we get fully reopened, we will actually be making 20% more just goods in terms of the United States and 6% fewer services. And the services will have a lot fewer kind of customer facing sales representatives and a lot more warehouse workers and delivery drivers. You know, and that's a big shift to not just to get people back to full employment, but to get back to full employment with a lot of people doing very different kinds of jobs than they were just three years ago. In our economy, you, know, you really can't, in a contracting industry, you really can't cut anyone's wages because it makes them extremely sad if you do. It's a major diss for the, you know, someone to say, last year we paid you $16 an hour, this year we're only going to pay you 14 And what that means is that if you want to pull people into the expanding sectors, um, then wages in the expanding sectors, wages in good produce, production, wages in warehousing, wages in delivery driving have to rise. And, you know, wages in those industries go up, wages in the contracting industries stay the same. That's inflation. Over and above that, you have all the supply chain bottlenecks, you know, and you want the price of something that's bottleneck, that's in really short supply to go up, because only if it goes up, do people have an enormous set incentive to figure out how can we do it without this? How can we substitute away from this? And also, how can we make more of this? So, you know, if you want to reopen the economy quickly and get everyone back to work in some normal situation quickly, um, you're going to have some inflation. Hopefully, the inflation won't be that much, and hopefully it will only last for a short period of time how much inflation, how short a period of time. Um, we do not have good models of this. We will have good models of this five years from now, now, too late for it to do any good. You know? And so right now, the Federal Reserve, it's trying to feel its way forward, um, raising interest rates, um, but trying not to raise interest rates so much that you know, people go bankrupt and stop spending at all. And then you don't have the reopening because there isn't the money to pay for people to come back to work, uh, but also not to raise interest rates too slowly so that PPA inflation continues and people begin to expect that inflation is just going to be another fact about the world. But again, what I'm wondering is, should they raise interest rates at all, given that interest rates don't really affect what's happening on our, the supply shocks that we're experiencing both oh, from China they and affect Interest rates affect housing construction enormously. Right. Right. And interest rates affect exports enormously. Interest rates um, affect businesses that compete with imports enormously. 
the Federal Reserve could bring inflation to a halt very, very quickly if it wanted to. But by shutting down the economy, essentially, what I'm curious about is, do they need yeah. to do that if some of the inflation, like the supply stuff, is hopefully temporary? Yeah, this is the question is, is this like 1947? Is this like 1951? Mm -hmm. Or is this like 1976? In 1947 and 1951, the Federal Reserve did nothing and the inflation simply passed and a year it was gone. In 1976, the Federal Reserve thought inflation was licked, and so it actually lowered interest rates, and it turned out to be very, very wrong. Um, I would say we don't know. I would say that until Putin invaded Ukraine, I was quite confident it was more like 1947 or 1951 than 1976. You know, but a key part of the inflation of the 1970s were the oil embargoes. And in the oil market shutdowns. And a key part of people thinking inflation is here to stay is what they see for gasoline prices. And so since Putin invaded Ukraine, all of a sudden things have become much more difficult and much more uncertain. And yet, and yet gasoline prices are down. Are going down. Are going down. Yeah. Are going down. But all that happens is that Putin has got to decide he wants Germans to be colder and cut off natural gas shipments again, and gasoline and oil prices will go way, way up as a bunch of natural gas flows across Europe to try to supply Germany. And the absent natural gas here means that people start burning oil instead. So, so what do you think? What do you, if you were to take a best guess, what do you think will happen over the next six to 18 months? If I were in the Federal Reserve, I would stop raising interest rates now. And I would wait for nine months and see where we are next June. Because the Federal Reserve has done a lot in the way of monetary policy. Over the past year, much of that has not yet hit the economy in terms of affecting employment and production. Right. You know, and the bond market thinks the Federal Reserve has now done enough. And, you know, the bond market is just the bond market, but there are a lot of smart people there and they have their own economic models and are running. That's not what the Federal Reserve is going to do. If I were on the Federal Reserve right now, I'd be an extreme dove. They're going to raise interest rates a bunch more and we're going to hope that it doesn't overdo it in terms of raising interest rates. I mean, the only thing I hope with them raising interest rates is that it gives them more ammo to lower interest rates when they really need to. Like later. Yes, 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 yes. But I also wonder, and I've, I've mentioned this to other guests, I've also wonder how much they're just talking a tough game right now and they will stop before we expect them to stop. They're, they're raising expectations so high that we're going to, that they're going to be painful that the market's already baking this in. Yes. Um, and of course, that as policy only works if it's believable. Right. Right. Um, that it has to really scare people that maybe I should start not spend so much because I no longer have a green span put there. Right. So we so if, if this theory is right, we should see at some point reduced inflation numbers. You know, and you know, I mean, Jay Powell and Lael Brainerd are very, very smart and have very good staffs and are doing their absolute best on this. But it's a very hard problem and Clearly, the question to which this is more like 1947 or 1951 than like 1976 is one that it's very hard to figure out in real time. Final thing I'm wondering, Slouching Towards Utopia. I love the title. It's clearly a reference to the 1960s book by Joan Didion called Slouching Towards Bethlehem, with Bethlehem being a sort of utopia uh, in, in her model of the world. And why that title? Why the... Um... Well, I needed a title. I needed a title and it was a placeholder and I never thought of a better title. That it's yes, a title. it's a nod towards slouching towards Bethlehem in which Joan Didion goes to San Francisco in the 1960s to the summer of love where all these people think they are creating a much newer and better world. And she looks around and says, well, you know, they're only slouching. You know, they're not walking or marching, or proudly at best, it's a slouch. You know, and Joan Didion is in return um, borrowing her title directly from William Butler Yeats's poem, The Second Coming, which is perhaps the best and most plundered poem in the English language in the 20th century. 
And Yates, it's also very much that, you know, some the very big change is coming. And we expected and hoped that it would be absolutely wonderful. But, you know, there are lots of signs that maybe something unexpected and not very good is coming instead. And I wonder, though, if this is a common theme of humanity, that we always think that we should have been at a utopia. We don't really acknowledge when things are just slightly better than they were yesterday. So we get disappointed and, and we, we focus on the dark. Like, jo, you know, yeah. Joan Didion not only went to San Francisco and saw people slouching, she, she saw some very dark things as well, which oh, scared yeah. her. Oh, yes. And we now see, just like we did in 2007, 2000, we now yes. see very dark things potentially happening to us. And I'm just wondering if this is kind of a, 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 a genetic feature of humanity. <laughs> that we rarely realize how good we have it. And that the first order thing is that you know, we go back to our, to our ancestors of 1850 and our lives are much, much more comfortable, more rich, uh, more interesting than theirs were, given that nearly all our ancestors back in 1850 would do things like spend six hours a day behind a horse if or an ox um, with the guiding the plow through the soil as we did the business of plowing the fields, which is not the most interesting profession in the world, I assure you. And that given our enormous technological powers and the sheer amount of wealth we've managed to create, we really ought to be a lot happier than we are. We ought to have created a world that is in which we can all feel safe, secure, be healthy and be happy. And yet killer robots do stalk the skies above Ukraine and Syria right now. And the monsoon is 200 miles off from where it should be and needs to be. Yeah. I mean, maybe happiness is not part of the human nature, really. <laughs> like, I don't consider myself very happy. I mean, I'm not sad, but I don't really, I'm not generally a, a, a happy person. And yet I'm healthy. My kids are healthy. Every, most people I know are incredibly healthy and, and you don't have a boring job that requires that you dig ditches all day and come home tired and sore with a hurt knee. No. And, and as you mentioned in your book, the average person can buy, makes enough every day to buy 2.4 million calories of bread, as opposed to 5,000 calories of bread at, at the beginning of the 19th century. And yet should the goal be happiness? Like I, you know, I'm not sad, but I'm not like jumping up and down in joy every day. Uh, I'm always thinking about the next thing. Right. Yes. Yes. So maybe, maybe just it's a, it's a universal nature that we slouch towards utopia, that for better or for worse, things are getting better. But... Or that it would be good if we did more comparisons and realized how good we have it. Yeah. In addition to thinking that how much better we could be doing. Yeah. Brad DeLong, your book, Slouching Towards Utopia, is one of those books where... And there's very few of these, but it's one of those books where your IQ will rise if you read this book. Like your general you knowledge much. of the state of the world will increase in phenomenal ways. And this book says new things. Like you won't just read the same thing you read in every other book. This is a, a new good history of the world and particularly economic history of the 20th century, which is the, the subtitle of it. And thank you. I read it and I was like, I have to talk to this guy and, and I'm so glad you were able to come on the podcast. Thank you very much. You know, that is the fact that people are like you are reacting to this book right now is making me extremely happy. You know, I won't say to the limit of human felicity, but damn close. Very nice. Thank you. Finding the music you love shouldn't be hard. That's why Pandora makes it easy to explore all your favorites and discover new artists and genres you'll love. Enjoy a personalized listening experience simply by selecting any song or album, and we'll make a station crafted just for you. Best of all, you can listen for free. Download Pandora on the Apple App Store or Google Play and start hearing the soundtrack to your life. 
At Discount Tire, we know how valuable your time is around the holidays. Get 30% shorter average wait time when you buy and book online at DiscountTire.com so you can spend more time with friends and family this holiday season. Discount Tire, let's get you taken care of.